Thank you for joining us in such a lovely room on such a cold day. My name is Alexandra Vakru. I'm the Executive Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished panel of people just back from Ukraine, if I understand correctly. <laughs> we have um, Miriam and Julius talking about their perspective on Russia and Ukraine, the ever-changing situation. And uh, we're especially grateful to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for European Studies, and also the Neiman Foundation for Journalism, which has so graciously allowed us to use this lovely room. Before I turn the event over to Wendell Stevenson, I would like very much to invite you to join us afterwards for a reception at the Davis Center. There are maps on the table outside as you go to the left, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a short five-minute walk, and we'll be having a reception there until about six or so. So let me introduce briefly Wendell Stevenson, a Neiman Fellow and a staff writer for The New Yorker and the moderator for today's event. Welcome. Is that too loud? It seems reasonable. Um, it seems like the, the timing for today's talk could not be more perfect, <laughs> more apophatic. Um, we've just all spent two weeks watching the Olympics in Sochi, where Russia tried to present their new modern face to the world. Um, and at the same time, we've been simultaneously gripped by the extraordinary events in Kiev. Um, and I'm delighted to have two of the best writers um, on Russia with us today to talk about uh, Russia in this new era of what might be called Putin 2.0, a kind of reboot of a more homogenous nationalistic nation. Um, and you can give us your insights onto his new idea and project for, for Russia. Um, Miriam and Elder and Julia Yoffe are both friends and colleagues, both journalists and co commentators. They're both of Russian extraction and have both lived in Moscow for several years and both interestingly, and we should hear more about this, maybe returned recently to the US to live. Miriam has written for the Atlantic Monthly and the FT among other publications and she was until very recently, until last summer I believe, Guardian correspondent in Moscow and she's now the foreign editor at BuzzFeed. Julia Yoffe has written for The New Yorker and Foreign Policy and Washington Post and many others and is now a senior editor at The New Republic. And she is just back, I think, today. Day before yesterday. Day before yesterday from Sochi and Kiev. And so <laughs> I wanted to ask first and quickly, um, how was it? What did you see? <laughs> it was awesome. Um, wh which part? Sochi or Kiev? Kiev yeah, first, okay. because uh, it's so much on the news. I know that Miriam doesn't want to turn her iPhone off. Um, what did you see? What was it like? What's happening? And maybe feeding into our discussion here, what happened? What do you think the role of media was in the Ukraine and in the protests and perhaps in the success of the protests? And how is it different? How is it a different kind of media landscape there from in Russia? Where I, have a, we, I think we have the feeling that there um, looking at what's happening in, in Ukraine with some envy. Uh, and anxiety, depends which part of Russia you're in. Um, so in Kiev, like in many other parts of the world, the protest started uh, with a post on Facebook. Um, social networks were crucial in organizing the protest and marshalling, uh, I mean, Facebook, Vkontakte, which is the Russian homegrown um, alternative Twitter, were all crucial in marshalling forces, organizing, uh, organizing people. You know, the situation changed uh, very rapidly, even in the three, four days that I was there. Um, I arrived Friday night in Kiev uh, very late, and it was the day that the agreement had been signed without the Russian signature. And even though there was a ceasefire, I mean, it truly felt like a ceasefire rather than a peace. Uh, I walked around the Maidan late at night and there were young men with shin guards and helmets and bolts with vests and bats and sticks and guns and shields uh, kind of lining up in formation, uh, marching around places, <coughs> screaming, you know, glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. Um, it really felt like they were taking this opportunity to kind of gather their strength because uh, there had been an ultimatum saying that at 10 a.m. the following morning, if Yanukovych didn't step down, that there was going to be more violence. And it really felt like they were preparing for that. And it was very tense. And I can't say that um, I wasn't scared. Um, but, and, then, and then it very quickly changed to this very peaceful outpouring, families in the streets, old people in the streets, laying 
candles and flowers all weekend and it just felt like you know the revolution was triumphant and and um you know that the that these heroes as they call them weren't you know it didn't die in vain and then and then uh, just very quickly but then um, I went to Donetsk for a day in the eastern part of the Ukraine. This is uh, Viktor Yanukovych's home base. He's from there. The Party of Regions was formed there. And the feeling could not be more different. People did not feel uh, that this revolution had been done in their name. Uh, they felt that um, you know people from the West who do not represent them at all came in, took power, and were now imposing their language, their culture, their identity on them. Um, and tearing them out of Russia's orbit, which would be economically disastrous for them. So people were not happy at all, but they didn't feel, unlike in the Crimea, th there was no sense that they were going to fight. I spoke to um, an operative in the city administration who said, you know, we're not going to fight, we're not going to hang on. If they bring in new people in our places, we're, we're going we're gonna to let go peacefully. But, you know, we're not too happy about it. What's going on in the Crimea in the last few days, though, is obviously a totally different story. We hear a lot about how there are sort of two Ukraines. Are there two medias operating too? Is there old media and new media? How has that influenced and shaped, do you think, the way these protests have gone? I think there is more than two medias, and, and I think this is kind of the key factor in, in Ukraine and what separates it, uh, makes it so different from Russia where a wave of protests was ultimately unsuccessful in the winter of 2011-2012. There's competition across all, um, all areas in Ukraine, in business, in media, in society, in politics. There's real competition so that when people came out in the square, they were able to find support from a fraction of opposition politicians in the Rada, in the parliament, to support them. There was media who, uh, that could get their message out to a wider audience. In Russia, we see that space. Um, basically non-existent anymore. Um, yeah, and, I wanted yeah. to throw it out to, to Miriam. You lived in Moscow until recently for, kind of, for six or seven years. Mm -hmm. So maybe can you give us a sense of the lie of the land of how the media in Russia has changed over that time, how you notice it changing, particularly there seems to have been this kind of um, increase of control and clamp down um, since Putin's re-inauguration. Um, in 2012 and the protests that seemed to have freaked him out a bit at that time and were clamped down on. Yeah, that was definitely the turning point. I mean, as you probably all know, it was, it was never that there was like a vibrant press uh, in Russia, but that space has become squeezed ever more since um, Putin came back to power in May 2012, was it? Um, so we see him going after, in sort of his sneaky way, you know, not just kind of issuing a decree and saying, we shall have no free media in Russia, but um, squeezing out a really wonderful independent television station called Dost or TV Rain um, that really harnessed a lot of the spirit of the protests. Um, that seems like it's on the, you would know better than I would having just been there, but it seems like it's probably not gonna last for much longer. Um, <clears throat> I think the really interesting thing is what they're, what they're gonna try to do with the internet because unlike Ukraine, you really do have this split in Russia where um, everybody with sort of an independent point of view, it's not even an opposition point of view, but anybody with sort of like a thinking point of view, uh, flocks online, internet use is incredibly widespread in Russia. Um, and so I think it's gonna be interesting to watch how they start to treat like online media. There are some attempts to try to make it register as, as traditional press has to register, and then that leaves space for a clamp down. So I don't know, I mean, you again, you would probably, having just been there, would probably have it's a better also, idea. Um, Laws either working their way through the parliament or already on the books that are um, that make it very easy for authorities to label something extremist in content and just pull the plug without any notification. Which, um, as we've seen, extremist for for uh, the Russian state can mean just about anything and is generally used as an excuse to go after enemies. Right, and they've done that even for like some people who have left like Facebook comments. And then a really interesting development is um, basically the loss of independence of, of uh, Vkontakte, which is, as Julia mentioned, the Russian version of Facebook. So it had been under pressure for months and months. The, the founder, who really is kind of like the Russian Mark Zuckerberg, he's like really young, he's kind of cute. And he's cuter than Zuckerberg. <laughs> and um, was finally uh, forced to sell to this uh, Kremlin-friendly oligarch, as we like to call them, uh, Usmanov, 
who also has, by the way, a 7% stake in Facebook, which everybody, I don't know, often seems to forget. Um, and so the question now is, is Contactia going to be able to continue as um, a safe space for, for discussion? Does it look like it's a kind of organized policy coming out of the Kremlin, or does it look like they're deadheading or prodding or intimidating or reacting to things as I coming along? What do you think Putin's vision for the Russian media is? I think what's happening is you know, the general Putinist uh, pattern, which is a signal is given uh, either verbally or um, non-verbally, and then the rest of the system kind of interprets it, and it tends to get warped, and um, get out of, you get a lot of this kind of, you know, Stakhanovite, you know, over-fulfilling quotas as it gets towards the bottom. So what you're seeing, for example, in the Russian parliament is this whole slew of insane laws that are, um, that are coming out. The most fav famous of these in the West is what we know uh, as the anti-gay laws, but this was just part of a package of uh, this kind of revanchist, um, conservative package of laws. Like there was one that didn't make it on, uh, make it to the books. That was uh, that would limit Russians to up to four marriages. Uh, there was one. They're now looking at revising the anti-gay propaganda. The gay propaganda law is making it uh, banning propaganda all, all <laughs> propaganda of all sex. So no sex education for so that way it becomes not anti-gay anymore. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one kind of passed in response to Pussy Riot, which was to criminalize offending the uh, feelings of religious believers. And you could just go on and on. And I think part of what happened was um, Putin got freaked out by the protests and um, kind of a signal was given around the time of his inauguration that you know they've gone out, they've protested peacefully enough. They lost. Putin won the election fair and square as he saw it, and that's it. And the party's over. And um, whereas before there had been a compromise where some liberal elements were allowed to exist around the periphery of the system, these um, because they showed themselves to be traitorous in you know Putin's point of view, and he really does believe that this is funded by the West and it's it's all designed to you know destabilize Russia and topple him. Uh, he's not wrong. <laughs> um, you know, the, I think the signal was given to just to clear the field, to um, get rid of any any liberalism in the system anywhere. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing now is this kind of like weeding of the garden that's taking on some really frightening forms. And it's probably going to get worse um, considering what's happening in Ukraine. I would like love to be inside the Kremlin right now. They must be freaking out so badly. I mean, they freaked out so badly the last time. I mean, right. Um, hugely academic term, freaking out. But in, in 2004, <laughs> 2005, when there was the, uh, when the Orange Revolution swept across uh, Ukraine, it really frightened the Kremlin and led to a whole series of measures. For example, the most famous of these is the creating of Nashi, which is this um, kind of proto-fascist uh, Kremlin youth group. Um, and it really kind of, it led to another weeding of the garden and closing all the loopholes uh, really extracting all the oxygen from the from the system and really shutting down um, on any dissent or opposition. He was really afraid that a color revolution would come to uh, come to Russia. And uh, when Michael McFaul, for example, arrived in Moscow in was it February two thousand twelve, uh, he was a specialist in revolutions, especially color revolutions. And it really, to use the term again, it really freaked <laughs> the Kremlin out and. Apparently, Putin really believed that he that M Mike McFaul was sent in by the State Department to bring him down and to bring a color revolution to, to Russia. And s separate from the sort of political fear that clearly opposition and opposition noises in media um, threatens the Kremlin and Putin, how is this sort of consolidation or control affecting the cultural, the broader cultural space in Russia? Do you think, and how do you think that reflects? Back on what, how they saw themselves as they were presenting Sochi, and how they, how you think the West saw them trying to present themselves. You, you again, you just got back from Sochi. <laughs> Take it away. I mean, there's there's Sochi, which is this kind of classic, um, almost Soviet effort to present a Russia that doesn't exist to the world, and then the world says, "Oh, look, it's not so bad." You know, like uh, we were free to walk around and. Um, and things were quite modern, and we didn't see anybody getting beaten up. And 
I don't know, maybe all of this is overblown. The problem is that Sochi was very much an island and kind of a one-off affair that in no way represents the, except for the you know, wild <coughs> corruption that went into it, um, in no way represents what Russia is actually like. As for the cultural sphere, it's becoming more and more uh, like it was in Soviet times, where you have a whole class of artists and directors and um, writers and singers, etc., who are seen as who are loyal to the Kremlin, and um, they, you know, they do things for the Kremlin. They can serve as attack dogs. They can sign letters attacking one of their own who's not loyal, but in return, they can. Um, they have access to a whole lucrative entertainment sector that's increasingly dominated by the state. You know, galas, uh, corporate events, um, concerts, they're allowed on TV, things like that. So it's even that is becoming hugely dominated by the Kremlin. Yeah, I think, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, there's like some interesting, uh, I think like the most interesting cultural figure is uh, Kirill Serebrenikov. Um, who's a, like a theater director and directs some films as well. And um, you've seen like quite a few of his plays come under attack, like literally under attack. He had a great play at Imchat. I think it was on after you left already. It was called um, like The Ideal Husband. And it told the story of, um, of like this guy who's, <clears throat> excuse me, like a rock star and hooks up with a guy from the Kremlin administration and they have this like gay affair. And this is in, you know, one of the most storied theaters of, of Moscow where, you know, Chekhov like premiered his plays. Um, and there's a, there was this insane scene a couple of months ago where you had these activists, because a lot of the time also, it's not like the Kremlin is standing up there, you know, waving its finger. It kind of um, allows for the creation of these almost vigilante groups. So is this guy, Dmitry Anteo, who um, has become sort of the face of like young uh, cultural conservatism. And he ran up on the stage and, you know, started shouting uh, to the crowd, like, how could you watch this? Jesus died for your sins and you're sitting here. And, this, that, and the other. And then it was Serebrenikov that tried to put on the, a showing of the Pussy Riot documentary um, at his theater in Moscow, and that wasn't allowed to take place. And that was the first time that I can remember, actually, where we had a letter from uh, an, a cultural official actually stepping in and saying, you can't do this. Like, you're getting, you're getting city money. You can't do this. Like, when I was there, even, you know, I left in, in July of 2012. It was much more um, kind of like insidious and <coughs> sneaky and quiet. And, this was just like very direct. This was an order saying you just you cannot do this basically or you'll lose your funding. Like you will lose your status as a as an accepted cultural figure. Yeah, I know I wanted to ask you about Pussy Riot and where you see this sort of strange <laughs> I know you because you wrote about them, I think, right from the beginning mm -hmm. and have continued to follow um, their antics and um, and how do you think that the sort of phenomenon of Pussy Riot illustrates what's happening in Russia at the moment, or do you think it's been slightly over exaggerated by the Western media because they're kind of colorful and have balaclavas? Those two things like aren't exclusive. I think that they were uh, important for like a certain moment in Russia in particular. I think they were really wonderfully emblematic of these uh, protests that swept Russia in the winter of uh, 2011 and 2012. They were just kind of like the brightest example of that. It was what they did was so extreme. Um, that it just, they were just kind of this perfect um, embodiment of the frustration uh, with everything that was happening. And just to what lengths some people were willing to go to send their message to Putin. And that they had to do such crazy stuff in order to send their message to Putin because he just wasn't listening otherwise. Tens of thousands of people were in the street and he was just kind of sitting there like, oh, okay. Um, whether they were overblown by like the Western media, I mean, yeah also, <laughs> but I also think they were, yeah, I don't know. It's been figure. interesting to watch them um, go through this strange cycle where they were very peripheral activists that mm -hmm. people didn't really notice much until they did this big um, performance at the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, then the show trial, um, you know, with Paul McCartney and Yoko Ono and um, stepping in and Alicia Silverstone trying to make sure that they got vegan meals in jail. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bless her. I mean, priorities, you know. Uh, <laughs> Whatever you can do, you know, to help. But then, you know, then they came out of prison and Miriam, I think, really brilliantly documented this in her last piece on them. You know, they just, they became... Um, really spoiled by their stardom. You know, they were blowing off Yoko Ono to hang out with Madonna. They were running around um, 
I mean, they're still running around trying to get money from all these people. They're basically just asking for thousands and thousands of dollars from people. They're going on junkets to Singapore. Um, then, you know, then they turned up in Sochi when I was there, and they were, you know, then they were back to doing their crazy activist stuff. You know, they were, um, they got a arrested while strolling down the promen promenade in Sochi, and then they get taken off to, the problem now is that it's all done with a huge, um, a huge herd of Western press in tow, following them everywhere they go. So they get taken. show. Yeah, so they get taken into the to the police station in Sochi. Um, they're in there for a while. The, there's like a hundred press waiting outside the gates for them with cameras, just pushing each other, elbowing, I mean, cursing each other out, trying to get a better shot. And all of a sudden, they come out in balaclavas and colorful dresses they changed inside the police station, <laughs> and they and they're you know screaming their latest song, which is uh, Putin will teach you to love the motherland. And they, you know, and nobody's touching them. The police aren't touching them. They aren't trying to stop them. They walk down the stairs and take off running down the street with this whole, <laughs> with about 100 foreign journalists running with cameras behind them, like pushing each other into the mud to get a closer view of them. You know, it, it's, um, you know, yeah, it's, they, they go back to their, their I think that's answer. why it's sad, though, because once you take it out of the context, like what does it really mean? They were they were part of a very important moment. They got the world to really kind of focus on what was happening in Russia, which is a very complicated story. You know, you guys might be interested. <laughs> a lot of the world isn't interested. All of a sudden, you have like these characters that you can focus on, and it becomes a very important role to play. Like now that the protest movement is dead, now that Putin has won, um, like what do you you know? It's like a tree falling in a forest kind of situation. Well, how do they play in Russia? How do Russians see them? I think <laughs> Russians are really tired of them. Um, I, I think for the exact reason Miriam said, it's just now it just looks like antics, which is what they've always done. It, they just happen to get it so right with their performance in Cathedral mm -hmm. of Christ the Savior. They happen to hit all the right notes, all the right nerves in Russian society to get this attention. But before they were doing crazy. Also, you know, like they, they were it's like their stunt in the supermarket. It, it was all this kind of punk avant-garde stuff that Russians don't really understand. I think that it's part of part of the larger cultural landscape where, you know, where, where for Russians contemporary art is Picasso. So this is, you know, they, they, so this is like, they look at these girls and they think they're, you know, they're crazy and undersexed and, you know, what are they doing? But do you think that's sort of also part of um, a bigger issue or for debate about how the West and Western media is picking up on Russian stories and how they're looking at it and the just uh, as a kind of over focus on the colorful pussy riot perhaps I know you Julia you've written about this a sort of over focus on Putin um, and that you know as the strong man as the only man as this kind of perhaps exaggerated autocrat when in fact Russia is a big and complicated country do you feel sometimes that um, just as the Western media tends to sort of poke tropes at the Cold War and uses the same sort of um, iconography or rhetoric to describe it. Um, some of the details get lost. I, I, it's kind of inevitable given you know the rise of Twitter, the rise of Facebook, the uh, shrinking of attention spans. It's kind of hard, and and the and the decrease. Um, the lack of importance that Russia has these days. It's not, you know, we don't care about, Ru the Americans, uh, the American public cares much less about Russia than it did, you know, even 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so, you know, this was a perfect moment. It was a bunch of girls being um, put in jail for singing a song by a dictator. It's a very easy story. Uh, there's a very clear good, good actor and a very clear bad actor. And, um, and the word pussy is in it, and it's just a great story. And the other, I mean, how do you explain, uh, for example, a show trial involving um, 12 to 16 people who were at a protest that turned violent, and some of them may have hit cops, and some of them may not have hit cops, and you know, and they're, and it's, it's, it's just harder to get um, the nuance across to a population that cares less and has less of an attention span for it. Did you find this, Miriam, in trying to, <coughs> do you find too much focus on Moscow, on Putin, on, on certain kind of issues and um, stories? You know, I don't know if you 
what can you tell us that, that we're not getting from the headlines? What, 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 is, what is not being covered about Russia as we look at it as just seeing this kind of increasingly reactionary Putin monolith? Um, well, I don't, I, mean, I, I personally, I don't think that there's actually too much focus on Putin. And I think that you can tell a lot about Russia through the story of Putin. I think, so I'd been living in Russia for a while when Julia arrived. And I think that what she did really well and that actually taught me a lot was like, everybody was really kind of using the Cold War tropes, you know, like, I remember like Russia would conclude some, you know, I don't know, some deal to sell a frigate or whatever you call them, or sell something or other to India. And, you know, everybody, including like the New York Times, would just freak out, and be like, the Cold War is back. And Russia's selling arms to India. And then, you know, Julia would like pipe up with, <laughs> with a story being like, okay, like if this, you know, if they manage to actually build this thing, and if it manages to arrive in one piece, like that'll be amazing, because Russia can't actually do anything right now. It is like still crumbling. So she brought this like, I don't know, this like focus of kind of realism to it, and exploding, I think, actually, like this Cold War paradigm. But um, like the fact that Putin, it's, it's he that is, that is actually trying to use the Cold War paradigm. It's not just the Western media, you know, he's, presenting himself as this like as this anti-West guy like the whole the anti-gay thing I've been convinced from the beginning um, partly for sure it's trying to find like an other to direct the hatred onto inside Russia it's creating like an internal enemy but it's also a way for him to you know say look at like the West where everybody's just having orgies and people are sleeping with everybody and it's absolutely horrific and it's the decline of the West of the West and here we are you know preserving uh, traditional beautiful values so he's also creating that dichotomy it's not just the media and it's gotten extremely uh, a lot more pronounced after the protest after the scare mm -hmm. he had with the protest also with the arrival of Michael McFall who provided an excellent foil for him um, he's really stepped stepped it up then he'll then he'll uh, you know walk it back a little bit and accuse the West of, of playing up Cold War stereotypes but really he's the one who's doing it and he's doing it very aggressively at home through the state-controlled media uh, you can see the uptick in anti-American sentiment um, that's very real I mean when you travel out into the regions and you tell people that you know you speak Russian really well but then you tell them that you work for an American magazine um, there's no way you can convince them that you're not CIA. Um, uh, you know, <coughs> it's a very convenient trope for him because um, it does rally the population still. His, his electorate is an aging electorate. They all remember the Soviet Union very well, which of course seems a lot rosier in retrospect. And so they might be living in poverty and their utilities uh, rates might be going through the roof and um, everything around them is terrible. And, their son has, you know, drunk himself to death at the age of 35, but at least they live in a country that stands up to America. They live in a country that's respected around the world. At least this is how they think they're, they're seen abroad. The problem is there isn't really a feedback loop. Like, they don't really understand how they're being seen abroad, that they're seen kind of as a joke, and uh, that Putin is more and more kind of transforming into a Gaddafi-type uh, figure. But they think that you know the West fears Russia, and rightly so. We're a mighty nation, and you know we'll figure this you know the small small change stuff out at home. But it's very important that we're a big power again abroad. But it's also interesting to me. I think um, I was reading that quite a lot of Russian press is given over, or there's a certain sort of more than you might imagine given over to what the rest of the rest of the world, i.e. the West, mm -hmm. is talking about Russia. There is an obsession with it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why? I, I mean, it's, um, I mean, you, you were on the losing team, and, um, and then and, and you want to be respected again. Um, it's hard for them. It, Russians don't understand how uh, little of a priority they are in the US, how much uh, China, the Middle East, um, take precedence over them, how much Americans, like Russians, are focused on their own internal affairs. Um, they really want to be respected by the West because they lost. And uh, the West's uh, and the world's approval of them it really matters a lot. And, and so there's often, you know, there's, I mean, the Sochi, um, the broadcast coming out of Sochi on state TV always started with, like, Look at what the West is saying about us, and look at how wonderful they thought our opening ceremonies were, and look at what they wrote about our mighty athletes. I mean, it's just 
that's also very Cold War, isn't it? You know, like that even the corrupt West is forced to recognize our greatness and brilliance. I don't know. Did you think it was a bit mean spirited when the Western journalists were laughing about the double toilets and the that the whole sochi? conversation? I just found so insanely boring. <laughs> I, I can't believe how many words were devoted to that. Like well, it's because the, it's obvious to me that there would be double toilets. It's just no, not news. <laughs> no, but I think you know there are double toilets. Talk about the double toilets. There's dirty water. Talk about the dirty water. These were like the most tweeted Olympics of all time. Like Twitter is a backstage, YouTube is a backstage, Vine, Facebook, whatever. Like the curtains were lifted. It was inevitable that we were gonna get um, get all this crap thrown at us because like that's, you know, Russia's a messy place. Like one of the reasons I wanted to be outside of Russia was actually to leave before the Sochi Olympics because like you couldn't have paid me to go there because I just knew that it would be like a disaster. There'd be no Wi-Fi in the hotels. Like you'd have to go through 10,000 security checks. There was no way I wanted to go through that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in the end, by the way. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, like every, I mean, I think it's just it's more a reflection of uh, the current media landscape, where you know before people would kind of complain about this amongst themselves, and now like with all the social media, it just kind of pulls back the curtain, and you get your frustrations out by you know typing them out, and taking pictures. It bored me. <laughs> you probably you have a different point of view. I just thought. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much of two minds about this, um, but I think there was, I, I wrote about this, I think there was a bit of schadenfreude in um, the way the lead up to the Olympics was covered. Uh, I think in part it's Russia's fault for the way it's been um, posturing on the world stage and um, the way it's been, you know, taking pride in not being a constructive not always being a constructive actor on the world stage and just often being very combative, that by the time the Western press gets to Sochi, all of that has sunk in and there is a kind of happiness and glee in seeing that they, that these crazy stupid Russians can't, you know, can't get their toilets right and can't get their electricity, you know, can't get the basics right because we do love to read about ridiculous Russian things. I mean, there's a reason there was a direct TV commercial, you know, with that with the <laughs> Russian oligarch saying opulence I chez it. <laughs> we we like that we like that stuff, and this was, um, you know, this fed right into that. But it's the same as I, like I feel like it's a little bit of a loop. You know, the more you ridicule, the more you get defensive and want to posture, and the more, you know, it's a bit sorry. I don't know. I don't really. I'm I'm not sure that I think it was Russia's fault. Like. It's the kind of a similar thing to you know like like bad Chinese translations like from the last Olympics, but you know every Olympics, I don't know I'm I'm not I'm not a huge fan of the Olympics <laughs> sorry but like every cover the Olympics story, um, no matter which country it's in it always follows the same the same um, schedule you know oh my God they're not going to be ready in time oh my God you know they have like in Greece you know there was a terrorist group running around that they had to get rid of in China also they thought they wouldn't be ready and then oh no and you know people are getting moved out of their homes and their rights are being violated and the second the opening ceremony starts it's like oh, ice skating <laughs> you know but like what shocked me about this Olympics really was um, what was interesting about it was that everything was really so focused on um, LGBT rights in Russia. And I really thought that we would see some athletes um, come out and do something, at least like wear a pin or have a flag or something. And I was what shocked me most of all about this was that we didn't see a single, a single expression of solidarity with the LGBT community. I think um, because this really, I, I have, a t I mean, I. I know I have to say I have to say this preamble. I have a ton of gay friends. I was a witness at a gay wedding. Oh God, summer, here but, we go. <laughs> but I think this whole thing was just so overblown here in the West. Um, like the fact that no uh, no Olympians did anything at the Olympics is huge. For example, uh, the U.S. sent a delegation with several gay uh, members. Uh, not all of them were out. And the president of the United States ended up accidentally outing Brian Boitano because mm -hmm. Brian Boitano wasn't comfortable being out, you know. Like, and and I think that <laughs> says a lot, you know, with people um, freaking out about, you know, what's going to happen with the with the athletes in, in the Olymp at the Olympics, and are they going to stage a protest? Are they are they going to wear, you know, a rainbow pin or you know do something akin to the Black Panther salute? A lot of athletes come from countries where they're not comfortable being out. 
um, and the U.S. is no exception. I think we we have a, still a very long way to go. I mean, if we just saw what happened with Arizona, we have a very long way to go. Um, yeah, and I, th I think the the, uh, the West and the U.S. especially made a lot of hay out of this where um, there wasn't any to be made. Do you have a sense after it all went well and the and the ice skaters twirled happily? Um, what the kind of takeaway for the West was and what the takeaway for the Russians was? Or was the end of Sochi rather overshadowed by the um, Sooty Maidan fighting? Yeah, I haven't really taken stock. I mean, what I'm, what I'm really thinking about right now is, um, I don't like, I think, I don't think that the, the LGBT issue was overblown. I think it was like uber simplified um, a lot of the time. So, you know, you have people really walking around the U.S. thinking that you can be arrested for being gay in Russia. Like, that's not the case. You can be fined um, if you, you know, <laughs> commit whatever propaganda in front of kids. But it's still, like, it's a, it's a horrible thing. And what's terrifying about Russia is that it's moving backwards. And that Russia, as we see with the Olympics, as we see with a bunch of other things, um, holds itself to a different standard. It holds itself to like a European slash Western standard. It's a member of the G, you know, is it G8 or G20? I can't even remember anymore. <laughs> <sighs> it's a member of the G8, it's a member of all these, you know, big clubs. And if you want to sit at these tables, you have to respect people's rights, um, you know, to a certain degree. Unless you're China and you just can overpower that with, with your economic money. Life, <laughs> exactly. Which Russia does not have. Um, Precisely. <laughs> no, but I just um, like I don't I don't think that it was overblown. I think it was really right. It was because it seemed like a key moment. It, it was I think it was really important to focus on that inside Russia. It was just simplified. In Did a that lot have of an test. effect? You think for Russians watching, for Russians being sort of called on that um, by the rest of the world? Well, what I found um, is that um, in in if you want to find the positive side to all this, that. Um, I've had more Russian friends like come out in the past year than yeah than like than ever before really and then you have people who never would have spoken up before Anton Krasovsky is the perfect example you know people who were really like enmeshed in the system and who were profiting from the system by being on state television or what have you and then finally being like I can't take this anymore like I'm gay I'm proud and I can't be a part of this there is like this pushback that I think is interesting and that's coming from being sort of supported by the Western spotlight on this issue, do you think? I think to a degree, yeah. What it's cool, you know? It's yeah, not I like... Know, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What, but what I also found, though, was that among the kind of broader liberal opposition, there was some fatigue about this. Um, because from where they're sitting, they've been under the, under the thumb of the state for a long time. Uh, they've been losing jobs because of it. Um, they've had their freedoms circumscribed just because they don't agree with uh, Putin politically. Then uh, along comes this anti-gay law and the West is up in arms over, over this minority that they don't, you know, for them, they're not being persecuted any worse than they are. And so for them, it was kind of, it was kind of rich for, um, for the gays to be, I mean, and there's obviously a lot of overlap between the gay community and the liberal opposition. But um, what I heard a lot of was just people being fed up with uh, all the attention it was receiving from the West, while the West was not in any way paying attention to um, to the pressure uh, that the that the state was putting on the opposition. Let's talk about the opposition a little bit at the moment. I think it seems like it's cowed and fractured. <coughs> um, I don't know if that's a characterization you'd agree with. Um, what a what platforms do they have? What openings do they have? How can the, that voice be heard now in a practical way in Russia? How is it being heard? Like on Facebook, <laughs> is it individual posts. Um, that's the sense that I get from afar. Like again, I haven't been there since early December. Um, you had Alexei Navalny who, you know, I guess, I don't even know if we can call him the de facto leader anymore. There isn't really a leader. I think he just got put under house arrest. Yes, and, and he's not going to kind of whack a mole. Yeah, and the, I mean, the worst thing, like house arrest, okay, like he's not going to be able to go online. Yes. Which, that's, that's everything to him. That's how he got his message out. But just for two months. That's a really long, could you not go online for two months? Yeah. I would die. <laughs> <laughs> um, but aside from that, in terms of organization, what is, so 
what's it? Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. it, it's not just uh, it's not just that uh, Putin won by uh, you know speedily dispatching his prosecutors and his cops and his uh, judges to uh, bring them under his thumb. It's also the the opposition in classic Russian fashion has very adeptly hobbled itself through infighting, through um, m you know mutual suspicions, <coughs> through not you know just being being a pretty diverse and democratic group they can't really they don't have one message they they can't have one leader because there's just a lot of them um, and to some extent all Putin had to do you know and this is what he did in addition to applying pressure here and there is to just sit back and let them eat each other up which is what they did so I wanted to talk to you about how it is for um you as Western reporters to report on Russia and how that has changed in the last two or three years. Has it got more scary? Has the red line moved? Are you in a sort of slightly protected category? How does that compare with your Russian colleagues? Yeah, I mean, definitely the Russian colleagues take all the risks. I don't, I never, I would never say I felt scared. I mean, you replaced Luke Harding, who of course got kicked out for The Guardian. Yeah. So Russian, I mean, Western journalists not immune from... No, but getting um, deported... Is different from being imprisoned. Or being killed. Yes. Or being beaten. Or losing your finger because you've been beaten so hard. Or losing your livelihood. Uh, I mean, yeah. there, there are journalists who... Nothing's really happened to them. They're, they've just been blacklisted everywhere, and they just they can't work anywhere because the order went down that we don't feed the opposition and we don't let them earn their bread. And that's what's happening with Dosh now, the... Rain TV, uh, the way it's done is this, it's the usual combination of sneakiness and brute force, which is, uh, you know, we don't just pull the pl plug on Dost with our own hands. What we do is we make it look like Dost is economically unviable. So we put pressure on the cab cable operators, on the satellite operators, on the um, advertisers to cut slowly cut off uh, their lifeblood and, you know, so you talked a little bit about Facebook, but is is there other little sort of bubbling spaces of satire and social media and stuff? Is is that one place? Maybe there's there are other voices. I I think I read somewhere that you know the the le the amount of um, sort of censorship or oppression you were likely to invite was going to be commensurate with the audience. So if you had a large audience, then that was mm -hmm. definitely. But small, maybe there are smaller operations that you know about or, or individuals or voices? Yeah, I mean, I think Twitter is like incredibly important. And that's in part why Navalny became so popular was because like he didn't adopt this very staid, like boring um, state TV kind of approach to talking about issues. He's incredibly funny. He's in, for all his problems, he's not a perfect person by any means. But um, with all his, you know, just being sarcastic and being kind of out there. And there's plenty of voices like that. But um, I don't know that they're like collected into one to one kind of space aside from like social networks. I mean, you saw this, uh, going back to my earlier point about the infighting among the opposition, you saw this happen during the protests. Uh, when all of the people who used to live online went offline, this is Navalny's term, that the, that the revolution was a revolution because all these people went offline and went from be, left their computer screens and went out into the streets. Uh, as soon as they, as soon as they went out there and met each other in cafes or you know on the on the on the public square, they suddenly realized that they didn't always like each other, didn't always agree with each other, and then it filtered back into the online uh, sphere with very public infighting, backbiting, uh, oh, yeah. fights. Uh, just you know, and and a lot of people watching this, a lot of their audience, which also came out, which had been their audience online, then also went offline, and then saw this. Again, online, this this fighting and bickering was also very turned off by it, and eventually stopped going offline. Yeah, the worst was like between Pussy Riot and their lawyers, actually, and just like just spent like literally they would spend they spent like the past year on Twitter fighting and just fighting so meanly and cursing all the time. And then the 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 third member of Pussy Riot who got out early a uh, year early, um, she told me that she has spent the last year of you know. But I asked her what she's done with her freedom, and she said she spent it in court, fighting her lawyers, fighting people who 
um, are trying to get a hold of the copyright. Or, I mean, it's kind of insane that you go through a show trial and a brief prison sentence and you decide that all you want to do is spend your time in court fighting your lawyers <laughs> over ideological purity. And that really turns people off, understandably. Yeah. Both of you left Russia relatively recently after being, living there for several years. Is this sort of climate of nastiness or this reaction um, or the going backwards, as you described it, was that part of the reason? I mean, I'd been there for seven years. It's not an easy place to live. Let's get that out there. Um, but also, um, I felt like I'd seen a full cycle. So I arrived in Russia at the end of 2006 when Putin's support was really at its height. Um, like just having random conversations with people on the street, they were, most people were really happy with him. It was still like the post Yeltsin glow. It was the, you know, people respect us on the world stage. You had the glow of standing up to Bush over Iraq and, you know, being proved right. There was tons of money. Oil was like $147 or $143 a barrel. And um, everybody was riding high. And then to see um, like the Medvedev kind of <laughs> playing with like liberalism era, then seeing the protests and then seeing the clampdown. Um, and it just, it just felt like a full cycle and yeah, you know, maybe that has to do with a bit of like the Russian extraction that I have and just having grown up with like stories of the Soviet Union and of the stagnation um, and just, you know, reading about it and stuff it was just kind of knowing that this like this period of like, <sighs> I don't know how to describe it, but this period of just like not much really happening. Stasis. Stasis, thank you, perfect word. This is why you are a staff writer at The New Yorker. <laughs> um, so often, <laughs> it'll be edited by someone in a minute, yeah. Um, but to see that kind of set in, I felt like, um, like yeah, I'd come full circle and also um, my eyes weren't fresh anymore. You know, I remember shortly after I came back, Kaspatov was on like some show on MSNBC and uh, was talking about having been like beaten up and arrested outside the um, the the pussy riot verdict, and I was just like listening and like yeah whatever. And then I think it was Lawrence O'Donnell or somebody who was like interviewing him. He was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you were beaten up and arrested? That's insane. And I was like, oh yes, that's crazy. Like that's <laughs> that's not a that's not a normal thing. And so when you when you start <coughs> when your eyes just aren't fresh anymore and you start like taking that as like oh 50 people were arrested, I'm not even going to call my editors. Yeah. It's time to go. <laughs> Was it a sort of similar? Um, I didn't see as much as big of a cycle uh, as Miriam saw. I saw a different cycle. I saw, um, I had been to Russia throughout the 2000s in short kind of reporting bursts and then moved there in 2009 and saw this kind of flowering, this opening. And then I saw the protest and then I saw the clamp down. Um, <coughs> My eyes definitely weren't fresh anymore. I remember somebody coming to visit me from the States and saying, how can people park on the sidewalk here? And I said, what? Oh, yes, that is very strange. Uh, you just you start seeing things like a Russian, and that, that's um, sometimes good for your analysis and your reporting, but um, often it's not. I also just saw that um, these events that I, I was starting to go native to, and I, and I saw that these events that so shook the world of my uh, friends and the people I was close to did not matter at all to the people back home. Uh, editors didn't care about it. Um, my friends didn't care about it. You know, and, and I saw that the longer I stayed there, the more I was going to um, stay, you know, a oh, one-trick Russia pony. And here I am a year and a half later <laughs> at a Russia panel. Is it, um, is it quite difficult to be a Russia expert, particularly if you're both have Russian backgrounds and <laughs> speak fluent Russian. Is it difficult sometimes to navigate professionally and emotionally between in that space? Hmm. I, I found it uh, very hard for me for the past like two and a half years. Um, like I said, I uh, collected more and more very close Russian friends and um, people who. I'm close to are increasingly being targeted by the state. One of our, one of our friends uh, was just amnestied by Vladimir Putin in December. She was she's just turned 29. She has a seven year old son. She was facing two years in jail for yelling at a protest and uh, lost a year of her life going to court. Like yeah, I mean, she developed day. gastric ulcers. Uh, she is now no longer employable pretty much anywhere because she's politically toxic, 
Um, you watch the, this stuff happen. You know, we uh, we were both friends with Alia Kashin, who was savagely beaten, had both of his jaws broken. I didn't know people had two jaws, had his finger ripped off. Um, you watch this, or a lot of my friends now work at uh, Dorst, at this independent TV channel, and they're fighting for their lives, and they know that they're going to sh be shut down soon, and they won't be able to work anywhere, um, and they all have families to feed. You watch that happen enough, and you get really angry, and you get very upset, and it's hard to see straight. Um, and that's also one of the reasons that I left, that um, the story had starting to become too personal for me. Me? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I agree, but I think um, I don't. I th I think I have like maybe a bit more distance to it, just because like I don't. I don't think I feel as Russian because like I was born here. I like didn't grow up speaking it. I had to learn it. Like I, I came in like kind of feeling like an American, totally feeling like an American, but just kind of with like my mom's voice in the background being like in Soviet Union, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but of course, like it's very hard when um, when you start seeing this kind of stuff happen happen to your friends, but not always in like a negative way that it just kind of affects you too much. But it also, I think, pushes you to just to want to understand the story more and to like write the story more. That's like this balance between, I guess. There's the also a feeling I'm I'm at this point in the cycle now after um, spending about two months out of three um, in Russia this winter, um, where I just want the place to burn down. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, is this on camera? <laughs> no, I mean, it's just sometimes you just get so fed up with uh, its cynicism and its cruelty and its um, uh, inhu and, and just hopelessness. And you just, you know, you know your Russian history and you know it's been like this and it's probably going to be like this. And it's probably going to get worse before it. It'll get worse. It'll get a little better. Then it'll get worse again. And it'll plod on for another few centuries, um, taking, you know, breaking people's faith in its path. And, um, and you've just made it worse for yourself by becoming close to people who are going to get, you know, are going to get broken by it. And you just kind of want to close your eyes and just not ever read another news story about it, and not have to write anything about it ever again. Um, I kind of hate the place right now. Um, I mean, also just seeing what it's doing in the, in the Crimea. Uh, seeing what it's doing to the to TV Rain, um, the sentences that these kids just got uh, it was a, uh, on Monday yeah. for uh, this I, I don't know this guy um, he's has a young daughter he just got two and a half years in jail for throwing a lemon at a special forces officer the lemon hit the officer's Kevlar vest and he said he felt intolerable pain and so now this guy's going to rot in jail for two and a half years. And um, you just kind of want to say, you know what, fuck it. I don't care. You know what, I, I'm just, this is too depressing. Yeah, well, if you, there's always the Middle East if you get tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's plenty of bad news stories around. Um, should we throw it out for, uh, out for questions? Oh, I'm turning to the American conservative movement next. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, in the blue. Yeah, I'd like to ask about the fear of terrorism before the game. Um, a friend of mine from Azerbaijan said, oh, Putin will have wrapped all that up. You just have to spread some bribes around the right place, and uh, there's not going to be any problem at all. Is that credible? No. Uh, you never know. It's not a very good system for battling terrorism. Uh, they haven't been very good at battling terrorism at all. Um, it, it, they kind of play... You know, it's like squeezing a balloon. You squeeze it here, it pops up here. Um, right? I mean, we saw the first time the world has paid attention to terrorism in southern Russia uh, was because two suicide bombers set themselves off in Volgograd, where this kind of stuff happens all the time. When you live in Russia, this is another thing. You're like, oh, someone drove a truck full of explosives into a police post next. You know, and. <laughs> It just yeah. happens every day. And so, you know, when they picked Sochi as the spot for the Olympics, you think, you sure? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that nothing happened, frankly. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot when you throw money at it. That, that's one of Putin's preferred ways of doing things, is to throw money it at worked, things. I don't, know, I don't know that it worked or that it was just dumb luck on it. I, I don't know. Yeah, I might say more about the, the way that the 
like the main rebel or terrorist groups are organized right now. Like they're, you know, they were very, very strong. Um, I guess like the, the, the last big attack was the Madiedova or the Metro was after the Madiedova? The Madiedova, the last one. It wasn't the Metro after the Madiedova? Mm -mm. It was the Metro? I see you like, oh, no, I was. No, yeah. it's the Metro. Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, and so the attacks like in actual Moscow proper, um, like there haven't been all that many, like there used to, you know, that there used to be when they attacked the theater and, and this, that, and the other. So it might also say more about just how poorly organized the rebel groups also are right now. They, um, and, and that, I think part of that is pressure and uh, fighting from the state and the state uh, and the Russia and Moscow co-opting some of these leaders. Also, I remember uh, trying to do a story about about this um, before, kind of while everybody was still on the gay thing, I wanted to write about the terrorist thing. Um, and I called several experts, and what they all told me was that, you know, Doku Umarov, <coughs> the leader uh, of, these, of the main terrorist group in the North Caucasus, he has called for attacking the Sochi Olympics. However, most of his guys are in Syria right now. Mm. <laughs> yeah, good point. So, yeah, that might not be because of anything Putin has yeah. done. Sorry. I'm very interested, first of all, that you never mentioned Edward Snowden or the NSA. And I, well, you just said oh, <laughs> Because it seems to me he's, <coughs> he is the perfect Rorschach test for foreign perceptions of what's going on in Russia. You know, is he a hero? Is he a prisoner? Is he in a holding pen? What the perception of NSA is? Can you talk a little bit about that? That, the last story that I worked on before I left Moscow was I spent like three days in the airport trying to find Snowden. <laughs> this is close to my heart. Um, as for like perceptions inside there, as I understand it, like it's not much of a topic of conversation. He's just a, you know like kind of the latest um, latest person they've kind of taken into their fold and kind of hidden away. Um, you don't. It's not like he's just walking around the streets of Moscow. As far as I understand, he's not in. They think he's actually outside Moscow, and um, the snapshots of his life that we do get are all through my favorite tabloid. It's called Life News, and it's basically like an arm of the FSB. I'm exaggerating, but it has very quote unquote very good contacts with the FSB, and um, so they've released a photo of him like hanging out on a boat, grocery shopping. Grocery shopping. So it's like you know, it's like these these very specific leaks um, to show, oh look, Ed's just living a normal life. Um, but I just, as I understand it, he's not really a topic of conversation. I can say with my Russian friends, he doesn't really come up. He did when he first got there. And actually, like that's one thing where like a lot of liberals like the in the opposition were like, yeah, hell yeah, like that's cool that we accepted him. Yeah, but uh, although they also un uh, understood the hypocrisy of it, because there's yeah. huge hypocrisy to it, right? Um, talk to anybody who works as a diplomat in Russia, and you'll know how good the you know the S SVR and the FSB are um, at playing the kinds of games that the NSA plays, um, and all this stuff about you know well of course we can't send Edward Snowden back because he'll be put to death, and Russia is so humane it doesn't have a death penalty, which is technically true. We just find other ways of putting people to death. Um, I think people talked about the hypocrisy of it as well, but again, this is kind of the liberal. Uh, oppositionally minded side of Russia, I think. Um, for the for the Russia that watches state TV, I think it all went down very smoothly as um, uh, a young man being persecuted by the evil United States and grand grand old Russia, you know, taking him under its protection. Do you want to choose where where you? Send your question about um, just like socially as uh, someone from Russia and someone <coughs> who is ethnically Russian, is there like socially and also professionally like an expectation that you take, you would take Russia's side in, you know, a so called dispute with the West? Like, is there an expectation that you would be on their side rather than, say, the West side? By whom? Uh, just ordinary Russians who you would be interacting with day to day. Uh, there's a kind of, there's an expectation that you might understand it better than those stupid Americans who, of course, don't understand anything about our Russians, our deep Russian soul, which is kind of DRS. <laughs> DRS. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, my favorite uh, escape tactic, right? Is 
apparently the Chinese don't have a deep Chinese soul. That's all perfectly comprehensible to anyone, but Russia is just, it's just, <laughs> unless you're born there, don't even try. Um, I, because I'm not ethnically Russian, because I'm ethnically Jewish, I got kind of the, yeah, high five. <laughs> I, um, I think we got a different treatment, and you see it from the kind of the bots commenting on our articles. There was a lot, a big strain of um, you're a traitor. Of course, you sold out. Um, you sold out this country for thirty, uh, you know, for thirty shekels. Yeah, with a name like Miriam, of course, you're going to write anti-Russian articles. Yeah, you little yid. What yeah. can, what do you understand of our of our grand Russian history? Um, I tried not to read that, but I know that it kept my parents up at night many, many times. Uh, but the the um, the strain of this kind of late motif of um, of being a traitor, I think, has gotten stronger everywhere in Russia. And now, opposition people who are in opposition to Putin are also now also traitors, which is a new thing um, that you can't just disagree. Um, before you, you could disagree, you were wrong. Before you could disagree, you were probably being paid by the West. But now you're an outright traitor. And there is this uh, kind of documentary that state TV has put together about the opposition. Before it was called Anatomy of a Protest. And that came out uh, two years ago. Now it's the biochemistry of, um, what is the name? There's, I'm losing it. Uh, the biochemistry of betrayal. Uh, which is how it's being, you know, that it's just that, that these people are just clinically messed up and can't, you know, just physically aren't able to be loyal to, to Russia. Hi, uh, my name's Tim Rogers. I'm a Neiman and a foreign correspondent that's been based in Nicaragua. And I wonder if you have any insights as to, to explain Russia's recent increase in military activity in Latin America. Um, in the last couple of years, they've become very involved, last year especially, they've become very involved in the war on drugs in Latin America. Russia says it's because cocaine that's flowing north through Latin America is ending up in Moscow, and so they want to try and cut it off in Latin America. Um, they sent battleships to Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua last year, um, bombers to Nicaragua and Venezuela, and they're, right, they're negotiating right now to create a military base in Nicaragua. I wonder if Nicaragua also has fantasies about Cold War stuff, so there's that alliance. But I wonder if you know if this is posturing, if this is strategic, or what's going on. I mean, I haven't really heard much about this, but my hunch would be that it's um, trying to position itself in America's backyard a bit um, and to kind of give America a taste of its own medicine. I mean, because in, in Putin's mindset, this is what we're doing in Ukraine, in the Baltics, with uh, NATO expansion, um, things like that. But uh, this is the first I've heard of it. So. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's probably like posturing and strategic at the same time. Like, they're doing all this, how, uh, is, you know, yes, how effective can it be is another question. Like, I was looking yesterday at um, one of our correspondents at BuzzFeed was looking into Uganda, because Uganda has just passed this, like, this, a really horrific anti-LGBT law, or has just adopted it, on, the president signed it on Monday. And so we found this video clip of, like, of the president of Uganda just um, going crazy about Russia and had just <coughs> bought, like, all these planes, and it was the first time some, I don't know, military flight simulator had been, um, had been bought from Russia on that part of the continent and stuff. So I think it's definitely, like, that... Putin spent a lot of time kind of, um, the, fr the phrase inside Russia is like, you know, getting Russia up off its knees, um, kind of like consolidating, and now is the time when you just kind of start lashing out. As to how effective it would be, I haven't heard anything actually about the drug war thing in particular, which is really interesting. Um, you'll you'll see a story on it yeah, on just... BuzzFeed tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> Hi, uh, uh, just to go back to a minute to uh, the Suchi and the press at Suchi, and you had talked about the short on swore about the toilet, and, but why was the um, American press um, so reluctant to um, admire the achievement of the, of the Russians in terms of 
I mean, the pavilions, and they had this amazing, like, 21st century uh, cars going up the mountains, and apparently it was, like, fantastic. And forget about the toilets. I mean, the actual side of the Olympics, it was, it was an amazing achievement for any country, and it felt like the, the U.S. media, they just, they wouldn't, it was almost like they were jealous. I wondered if you would comment on that. Um, I, I don't think it was jealousy. I think um, Russia has this weird approach to this. On one hand, like Miriam said, it wants to sit at the big boy table and it wants to be held to, it wants to be seen as a European country and it wants to be respected as one. But then as soon as those standards are applied, it recoils and accuses the West of, uh, having, a, of having a double standard, of being um, discriminatory towards Russia and almost racist in a way. I think that's some of the undertone. Here's the thing, I mean, yeah, they did a good job building Sochi. They, I think, stole more money than I think any of us could have ever imagined building this stuff. And in the end, it's, I mean, it's a pretty low bar, don't you think, to say, like, the Russians were like, look at this, we built this road from this point in Sochi to that point in Sochi. Why won't you admire our road? Okay, you built the road. <laughs> I mean, if you're an amazing global superpower um, that can, you know, arm wrestle America any day of the week, shouldn't you be able to build a road like that through any, any terrain? Or like, okay, you built some stadiums okay, you're a big superpower, and you've had years to do this, and you've spent more money than God on this stuff. It, it better be a pretty damn good stadium. Like, I, I just, I don't understand this. Russia wanted to be patted on the head and praised for these stadiums and these roads and these trains. Like, these roads and these trains have spanned very short distances. They spent way too much money on them because of kickbacks that were as high as 80%. Uh, if you went a little deeper into Sochi, there were no roads to speak of, uh, and things looked pretty horrific. And again, if you want to be a, if you want to be a global superpower, why should you be praised for you know a twenty mile stretch of road? I don't understand why you would be praised for that. Shouldn't that be expected? I don't know. I just that. And they did get praised for like the Olympics. Like I feel like yeah. it was like a really big political story and. Again, like the second the opening ceremony happened, which, by the way, got a lot of praise. I mean, I actually haven't watched it because, again, I'm anti-Olympics, but <laughs> I've heard that it's like really, I don't believe in the Olympics, but I've heard it's beautiful. And after that, it was, it just, it just got turned over to the sport, including, you know, this 15-year-old what's-her-face and like a lot, you know, they got a lot of praise for the sport. I'm sorry, I don't like sports. <laughs> this is also, this is uh, also, um, an amazing kind of undercurrent at Sochi. Um, hanging over Sochi was Vancouver, where Russia just, Bombed. I mean, they, they failed to fail. I mean, they finished 11th in the medal count. This was a national tragedy. Their hockey team went home before the, you know, the medals were, um, before the quarterfinal. One Russian city had held a moment of silence because of this. Like, <laughs> not a joke. I mean, this was a national tragedy. And there was a fear that nobody really spoke about, but it was definitely there. There was a fear that Vancouver, there would be a repeat of Vancouver, but on Russian territory with Putin in the stands. Luckily, Putin was not in the stands at Vancouver, and Medvedev had time to cancel his trip to Vancouver after the hockey team lost, so he didn't have to witness uh, the national failure. And there was this fear this whole time that they were, there was this obsession with the medal count, and like, Oh, we're seventh now. Oh, now we're eighth. Oh, now we're fifth. Oh, now we're sixth. Oh, we're third. And it was just, it was like it wasn't just day to day. It was during the day tracking the. It was crazy. Like the Americans the, 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 do that too. This is why the no, Olympics no, no. suck. <laughs> <laughs> the Olympics suck, and um, and and but but it, it was this obsession with, and then finally squeaking through to first, and 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 that was when we can declare the Olympics a success, and. Forget all the money we spent on it. Where you know we have a generous Russian soul, and it was every every kopeck was well spent. Did you see that Medvedev hand gave them all Mercedes? Yeah, uh, yeah, the national car. <laughs> <laughs> they can't even give them a Russian car, like a Russian-made prize. There's no. This is the other thing that 
that is infuriating to me about Russia is that they, um, they have so much money and it's Saudi Arabia. Like there is nothing except for its water and milk that is made there. I mean, there's nobody has a smartphone that's built in Russia. Nobody has a car. I mean, maybe the car is assembled in Russia, but it's definitely not designed there. Um, not, nobody's wearing clothes made in Russia. It's just... They're not it, shopping in Russia even because it's so expensive. Yeah, I mean, it's just you kind of get the sense that it's a giant Saudi Arabia where everything is imported, even the, the gifts for their home. I mean, even their athletes don't train there. They're all like, you, you, listen, to, you listen to the sports commentator, and they're like, oh, this is, uh, you know, Yulia Lipinska. She trains in Hackensack. And really? Just, Does uh, she? I mean, they all train in Short Hills, New Jersey. Really? They, yeah. All of them. So... So was it a sort of hollow nationalism? Do you think that was presented? No, no. people the, were very people. The, the really hollow. Na I mean, maybe the, for the rest of the world, it looked a bit hollow. Maybe for Russians, not so much. Maybe, in a funny kind of way, the audience was always domestic. I think the audience was very much domestic. Also. I mean, it was also Western um, because a lot of Westerners I spoke to there who, who were visiting Russia for the first time were like. This is so bad. We were so scared to come here, and you know, we thought bears uh, ate people, and the people they didn't eat, the KGB beat up and imprisoned. Um, and you're like, yeah, that's all just bad fortune. Um, yeah, I think the audience was Western, but it was also domestic to show that you know Putin not only raised Russia up off its knees, but look at the kind of party he can throw. And this is why the quoting the Western press at the beginning of every newscast was so important because now the corrupt, stupid West can, can finally understand our true grandeur. They've watched our beautiful opening ceremonies and seen all the authors that we used to persecute, but now we're proud of. Um, you know what I really liked, though? OK, I did watch one little part of the Olympics. Like the, <laughs> the closing ceremony where, um, did you guys see this, where like they made fun of the fact that like one of the rings wouldn't open? Yeah. But that was so funny. And it was so like self-ironic, which is like a not very Russian trait, I would say. Like, do you it think is it is? Russian. I thought like that, and like just the fact that just that would have public. We can be yes. ironic about ourselves, but not. And the fact that like that thing came, like they must have done that at the last minute. I thought that was so cool. I liked it. That was nice. See? The themed at the end. Yeah, See. <laughs> so, so thank thank you guys for for coming and speaking. It's, it's been really interesting to hear your talk. Oh, um, yeah. I was in I was in China in the fall, and while I was there, uh, I did a, a little bit of research about the sort of non-state institutions um, in uh, in China. Things like work uh, housing administration units and um, uh, things like unions that uh, and there's sort of a theory, um, a potential theory that they could one day work to sort of bring about a freer society and uh, foment change in China. And I was wondering whether, in your experiences, you found anything like that, uh, you know, analogous in Russia, and whether you think there's a capacity there to one day change the system? With, with unions, definitely not. I mean, they destroyed the unions on purpose, because they basically were the agents of, like, the Bolshevik Revolution. Or, no, the unions still exist, but now they're extremely statist. Uh, so during the winter protests, one of the, uh, one of the Kremlin's tactics was to start playing a numbers game with the opposition. So uh, the opposition would come out with a giant rally, um, and the state would say, oh, it was just 1,000 people, and half of them were press. And then the next weekend, or the same weekend, they'd have a competing rally in support of Putin, and they'd hugely inflate the numbers. But what they'd also do is call all the local union leaders and tell them, bring 30 people and five posters. I know um, a family friend worked at a hotel, I mean, was the fin financial director of a hotel that was owned by these unions, and he got the call saying, uh, 50 people, five, five posters, be there, or you know, put your head on the chopping block. So right now, they're kind of agents of the state. Yeah, I can't think of what other institutions. Like, they've worked really hard to just kind of make sure that um, every non-state actor, every major non-state actor is somehow, um, somehow like pledges allegiance to the state. The church is obviously uh, the biggest example. Unions are another example. My favorite example is this dude who just showed up in Crimea today. Did you see this? That like, uh, no, <laughs> the head of the Night Wolves biker gang. Oh, like yeah. it's a biker <laughs> gang, and even they swear allegiance to uh, to Putin <coughs> to the state. So, I don't know. Maybe I have to think more. And then about the real non-state actors, you just apply pressure to them and marginalize them or put them out of business 
or drive them out of the country like they did with Golis, the you know the <coughs> election monitoring NGO. Um, they have it pretty well uh, organized. Um, I, I personally, I mean, and I think Facebook and Twitter are going to be next because yeah. that's what I was going to say. But yeah. I don't know. I, I don't. Facebook and Twitter were already once organizing forces for change, and it didn't really get us anywhere except for, I mean, ultimately it brought more repression. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm curious about this one thing. You've mentioned several times now that the Kremlin got usually freaked out by events uh, during the Orange Revolution, of course, but now in Ukraine. But then you're also saying that the opposition is very fractured and, and are not really able to come together. So if you can comment a little bit more on what are they afraid of um, and, and, and also how that plays out in society in Russia. They're afraid of what happened in Kiev twice already in the last decade. Uh, what? It's Why? not like the fear isn't a reaction necessarily to something that already exists or like the reaction to like a rational assessment of what's happening on the ground. It's an intense paranoia. That's the reason like there were never really protests. Um, so before like the big protest movement sprung up in Russia, you had this thing called like Strategy 31, you know, where people were gathering on the 31st of every month on a Triumphal Neoploshid. And like literally in the beginning, it would be like 50 people. I remember thinking it was a success, like, oh my God, when 300 people showed up. Um, and even that, you know, the, the the lengths that they went to to make sure that those protests didn't take place beyond banning them, beyond breaking them up, literally shutting down the square with construction equipment, you know? And that wasn't a response to, oh my God, these guys are gonna, are gonna convince the entire nation to rise up <coughs> against the Kremlin. I think it's always like, okay, if we just allow one little thing to happen, this can be the spark that grows into something big. So it's trying to nip it in the bud before it becomes something real. And and the why is is complex. On one hand, you know, on the simplest level, it's Putin losing power, and a um, little bit a uh, little bit more complex is those around him losing power and losing their um, their feeding troughs uh, and their access to the state budget um, and being able to siphon off gazillions of dollars from that. Um, I think, and, and then at a more profound level, I think it's now become, if Putin was a reluctant, um, a re reluctant successor to the throne, he's fully, uh, f he's now fully inhabiting that role. And after the, especially after the protests, especially after, I mean, you saw him cry when he, you know, at the victory rally in March 2012, when he, I think he was afraid that he would have to be forced into a runoff, into a second round, and then his, you know, the system, like I, what I mentioned before, you know, a, s a signal went down saying you can't, you can't go into the second round, and instead of delivering 51 or 52 percent, they delivered almost two thirds of the vote. He really s has come to see himself as uh, the father of a resurgent Russia, uh, that only his vision can bring. Uh, grandeur and restored respect and stature to Russia and well-being to its citizens. I think he takes this myth very seriously. Um, uh, Alexei Venediktov, uh, the head of the Echo Moskva radio station who loves to play it, um, kind of both sides, uh, both camps, um, said that when he asked Vladimir Putin recently, like a year and a half ago, what he, what he thought was his main accomplishment as leader of Russia, he said the reunification of the two churches, the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow and the one abroad. So he, it's not about money necessarily. It's not about power at some level. It's about doing what he thinks it's be is best for Russia and um, being afraid that, uh, like there was these paranoid <coughs> fantasies swirling uh, before the presidential election that you know if Putin isn't elected or if he's toppled, Russia will just um, go to hell in a handbasket, and the regions will, um, it'll fracture into separate regions, and there will be a civil war, and neo-Nazis will come to power in Moscow, and um, all, all of Russia's minorities will be slaughtered in a new holocaust. There's some level on which he really believes that, and that he's the one man standing between, uh, between Russia and, the, and the, you know, the yawning void. So, and that's a lot harder to deal with. I think we've got one, maybe two more questions. 
So um, kind of the opposite of what was asked before. My question is, how do you expect uh, Americans or Westerners, both <coughs> journalists and people, to react to Russia, to engage with Russia, if, let's say, two of the best journalists that we see here couldn't take it anymore <laughs> and had to leave? <laughs> um, but not only that, you journalists that have a personal connection and the ones that have a strong personal connection, and um, you often say we when you're talking about Russia instead of they. Yeah, I, I, know, <laughs> I don't. Interestingly, I noticed, I noticed you both did it. I don't, do I? She does it, I don't do it. Well, <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a general inclusive rhetorical... You know, no, I really don't feel we. a we with Russia, I have to say. Like, literally. But go ahead. She also hates the Olympics, for the record. <laughs> I, I don't remember the question now. Uh, what, what, how uh, how is the U.S. Where, supposed to engage where, with it? Where are the new journalists going to come from that are going to be able to deliver the best reporting if they don't have that personal connection? Maybe that personal connection is not necessary to the best reporting. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary It's at not all. necessary at all. I think... Um, and uh, there are some great journalists there right now. Yeah, I mean, I, if you think about some of the veterans, for example, um, Greg White at the Wall Street Journal has been there for 20 years, and he's developed a personal connection. He has a Russian wife and Russian kids, and he's lived there for 20 years, and he knows the place inside out, and he's just a great uh, observer of the place. There's a young, a new crop coming in, Max Seddon at um, BuzzFeed, Andrew Roth at New York Times. At the New York Times. He, I spent some time with him in Sochi. I didn't realize that he had only been there for three years. He speaks Russian basically without an accent. That's the thing with Russia. Like I'm sure a lot of you guys know it's this too. Like it, yeah, it just draws you in. So so many of the correspondents, um, like Max Seddon speaks better. My my correspondent, he speaks better Russian than I do. He's been like studying the place since he was basically seven years old. Uh, he's read almost every single novel that you can think of in Russian. I'm not talking like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, you know, but like getting into the real shit and a lot of. <laughs> Not that the Stayevsky and tell story, um, but um, so a lot of these, a lot of these correspondents, um, you know, I think I'm not. But the same exists with uh, with China, with Egypt, you know. Yeah, like people just get completely overwhelmed by this place. I don't think the personal connection is necessary, but I do think like the the reporters who tend to understand Russia best are the ones who go beyond treating it as a story. Because like the cultural history is so important, and people just like draw on you know these sayings and uh, these references in like their day to day life. So I think like this deeper knowledge is help is is helpful, but you don't have to be like of Russian extraction that, to, to have for, it. That's true for, for anywhere. Yeah, for for Nicaragua, for China, for Egypt. I, um, so to be obsessed with the place, like oh yeah, no. I mean it's. Not every, you know, not every uh, Russian immigrant kid gets obsessed with Russia. In fact, most of them barely speak Russian by the time they're my age and have married Americans and moved on and are the envy of my parents. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, I, I had a leg up starting, but I, I certainly don't. Th I mean, um, people who were there with us and who are no longer in Russia, like Mike Schwartz at the Times. Um, also went native. He's Ellen Berry Ellen was the, Barry, the yeah. New York Times bureau chief, who's, you know, yeah, just like one understands Russia better than like a lot of Russians themselves. Yeah, but uh, anyway, yeah. Do we have one more question one before wrapping it up? Anyone? You're a bit closest to the mic. <laughs> you got it. Um, so my question was, um, you were talking about how uh, so many elements of Russian society are sort of feeding at the state troughs or or co-opted partially by the state, how, as a, um, as a correspondent in Russia, do you cultivate relationships with those people who make up such a, a large portion of, of Russian society and Russian power and the Russian elite, um, given that you have this either real or perceived bias um, against the Russian state? Um, and, and does that impact how you are able to report on the place? Do you have like a, an actual just aversion to those people that, that makes you think that that story is, is not one to tell? Or, or how, how do you interact with the state dependent class in Russia? A heavy question with a lot of um, like, I, I mean, bias against the Russian state. I think, I don't know if that's how I would phrase it, just because I just think like the role of a journalist is to keep power in check. Like now that I'm working in the US, I hope that, you know. Yeah, oh, but I'll do the same with the U.S. government. Um, 
But um, as for that, like the way that I tried to do it was just go for like the younger people. You know, it's it's not about that you don't want to write their story. Um, it's like here, let's say you know you're a hardcore Republican. Um, are you not going to like write about Democrats? Like that's it's just not that the split is. <laughs> 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 that's not that's the way that I would just like define the Kremlin opposition split. But um, I would just like go you know for for younger people like go for coffees all the time with like Tina Kandalaki or something like that. Like go for these. You know, there are people in this space that, um, like, that I like to occupy in my kind of like personal approach, which is like, you know, obsessed with the internet, blah blah blah. Um, and there's plenty of pro, pro Kremlin people who are like that. There's this guy Robert Schlegel who is, you know, also this, you know, um, very very pro Kremlin because it helps advance his career and because he probably also personally believes in it. Um, but is also very very open to talking, you know. But like these old fogies, um, like it's it's. It's harder to get to get through to them. I would say that are like deep inside the Kremlin. Yeah, the people. Um, I found this hugely frustrating when I first got there. That there was nobody inside the Kremlin really that you could talk to. The the people who were actually calling the shots and the people who were at the table for the important conversations. You know, I had come out of New York and. Um, expected that there would be leaks somewhere, that there were sources somewhere that you could develop. And this was hugely frustrating for me. And I remember speaking to a friend and colleague at the Times, and he said, oh, did you think that the Times has sources inside the Kremlin? Because we don't. <laughs> because they won't talk to us. Um, for that, you have to kind of rely on your Russian colleagues who, have, um, who can use personal connections, whom even if they're with the oppositional press, these guys are more likely to, tr to trust because they're native. Or you know they went to school with someone who knows someone who is now you know <coughs> Lavrov's deputy or something, and for that um, building inroads into the local press is very useful because they can get in where you can't. And that was actually another reason that I wanted to leave Russia was that ultimately this makes you a very lazy, flabby reporter because you're like you just don't pick up the phone after a while because you've called enough times they've told you to send a fax with your editor's stamp. <laughs> um, they don't understand that your editor doesn't have a stamp because what kind of editor doesn't have a stamp? I made a stamp at BuzzFeed my first day there. <laughs> I was like, we need a stamp. Um, and you know, you know that the fax machine feeds right into the shredder, uh -huh. and after a year, year and a half of this, you just don't pick up the phone anymore, and you, you, then you stop calling the think tanks because you know that they're <coughs> bullshitting the, just the same way you are. And then you realize you're just writing what's in your head, and you're like, it's time to go. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Um, on that, let's wrap it up. Thank you so much, Miriam and Julia. That was fascinating. Bye. <laughs>